afternoon, my name is Melissa Dietrich, Associate Director of Membership, and I'd like to welcome you to the evolution of plant exploration at Longwood Gardens. This event will be auto captioning. If you have any technical challenges during the webinar, please message us through the chat box. This event will be recorded and the video will be emailed to all attendees. It is my great, great pleasure to introduce our presenter, Peter Zale. Peter holds a master's degree and a PhD in plant breeding and genetics from The Ohio State University. Peter is our Associate Director of Conservation, Horticulture, and Plant Breeding. He has participated in over 25 plant exploration expeditions throughout the United States, Japan, Vietnam, Myanmar, Republic of Georgia, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, and China. Peter will share about the importance of plant exploration and his recent travels. At the end of the presentation, he will be able to answer your questions. You may submit your question via the chat function. Peter, thank you so much for being with us today and to share about Longwood's long-standing initi initiatives of plant exploration. Right, thank you, Melissa, and thank you everybody um, out there who's attending. Um, so as Melissa mentioned, today I'm gonna to talk about plant exploration at Longwood Gardens. Before I really get into the, the nitty gritty of, of what that means, I'd like to talk a little bit about science at Longwood Gardens and sort of where this particular program um, is, uh, happens, uh, uh, is located at Longwood Gardens. Here we go. So we, science is a division of Longwood Gardens. When we think about the gardens that we have here, you think about the conservatories, the main fountain garden, you think about the things that you come to visit, but sort of lurking behind the scenes are a lot of the things that sort of drive what you're seeing in the gardens themselves. And so we are the science department and you can see the four different things that we do there. And a lot of what we do is based in research and we use this information to innovate uh, and coexist uh, within the natural war world in order to depict its beauty and its perpetuity for future generations. And so if you look at the four core uh, areas of our, our particular department, we have conservation horticulture and collections, which is where I'm based at, land stewardship and ecology. We think about the campus of Longwood Gardens, there's lots of natural areas um, that might not be open to the public, but are getting our attention nonetheless floriculture and production, all the beautiful plants that you see in containers um, and in the conservatory and throughout the gardens, a lot of those are produced here. And then uh, sort of more of the sustainability side, we do soils and compost, so sort of closing the loop um, of, of what we do. And so looking at our particular program, um, we're really rooted in conservation and conservation of plants and it is something I'm gonna talk about quite a bit today. And if you look at all of the various things that we do across the science department, you can see exploration, plant trials, which means bringing in new plants and seeing if they'll work at the garden, seed banking, a very conservation oriented um, um, action that we are participating more and more in, recognizing that storing seeds can help conserve some of our rarest plants. We do plant production. We do field work. Um, we also breed new plants and produce plants. And so we are a very diverse division, um, but plant exploration is one of the oldest programs within that division. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. And so when we look at plant exploration, plant exploration at Longa Gardens is inspired by our mission. And it represents continued dedication to new plant discoveries, global collaborations and plant conservation. Today, it builds upon a legacy of Longwood explorers compelled to traverse the far reaches of the world to learn more about its diversity, share its beauty, and contribute to efforts to preserve it for generations to come. And so you may ask yourself, why do we explore? And I think why when the program started and sort of the simplest answer is to bring in new plants. You know, when you come to Longwood and you see this diversity of plants, some of them are things that were bred by other people. Some are things that you might see at your local garden center. And then there are things that you might not see anywhere else. And this is where our plant exploration program really impacts the garden. But there are other reasons why we do this. And probably one of the biggest ones, if not the biggest one now, is to help cultivate reciprocal partnerships um, that give us the opportunity to preserve rare species and habitats. 
And through this, you know, through these collaborations, through these partnerships, we're able to participate in botanical surveys of the world's last remaining wilderness areas. And through this work, we're able to determine what plants might need our help, you know, might, might need extra work uh, for conservation. And so we're able to assess what plants are rare within these last remaining wild places on Earth. A big part of this is also looking at the cultural history and significance of plants globally. We don't think about plants the same way that people in Tanzania do or people in Japan might. And so the information that comes along with this field work and learning about these plants and learning what plants need conservation is fueled by the cultural importance of these particular plants. And from a more horticultural aspect, you know, certain species, if they're rare, we're looking to expand their genetic diversity. So rather than just having one of a particular plant, we want to have a group of them so that we can, you know, help uh, preserve not only that species, but the genetics that give them the chance to survive into the future. And then from all of this, if everything is going right, we might select and introduce plants. And you might not know this, but over the years, Longwood has introduced over 130 different kinds of plants to the horticulture industry, including the well-known New Guinean patient, which had its origins in the United States as a cultivated crop right here at Longwood. And then lastly, what we might do is connect cultivated species uh, to species of wild origin. And this could be for breeding disease resistance, it could be for crop improvement, it could be for conservation, it could be for any number of things. So there's many reasons that we do plant exploration beyond just bringing new plants to the gardens. If you look at the history of plant exploration at Longwood Gardens, the program started in 1957. And this is about the time when Longwood became a public garden. It was also a time in the United States when the, the horticulture industry, the nursery industry was not nearly as robust as it is now, especially with regard to the plants that we are, are available to us. You know, think about it now, there's tons and tons of choices. In the late 1950s, that industry was really just getting ramped up to where it is now. And so thinking about, um, you know, the need for these unusual plants at Longwood, the garden's first director, Dr. Russ Seibert, initiated plant exploration. You can see all of the places around the world where explorers have been. I'm going to talk today about work we've done in the United States relatively recently. Recently, I'm going to touch upon that, but really focus in on work we've done um, over the past few years in Vietnam, and then most recently, a new venture into Tanzania. And so when we think about plant exploration, a big part of what we're doing now is rooted in plant conservation. And there's this idea that public gardens like Longwood all around the world have a very important role to play to conserve rare plants. And so, you know, some plants are really common. You think about red maple here in the eastern United States, it's everywhere. But other plants like native orchids that we have here in the US, uh, in Pennsylvania even, and, and other things are, are really quite rare and they need our help. And so if you look at plant exploration and conservation, this diagram shows you some of the different things that we do. And really when we're talking about plant exploration, we're talking about the box highlighted in green, the botanical survey period, and then perhaps seed and plant material collections. And that's what I'm really going to focus on today. And our mission through all of this is really for Longwood Gardens to play an integral role in the discovery, conservation, and celebration of plants around the world and here at the gardens. And so thinking about plant conservation, um, this is a concept that we, a program that we started at Longwood in 2015. And if you've been to Longwood Gardens, you've been to the orchid room, you understand that orchids are a critical component of the displays that we have here at the gardens. And a few years ago when I started here, we did this project called the Hagley Project where we compiled the invoices and notes and every little bit of information that the DuPonts, the founders of Longwood, ever sort of put out there in regards to bringing new plants to the garden. And so we put all this information together and it came in, it basically amounted to a spreadsheet with 38,000 line items. So they were very, very active in bringing new plants to the gardens. One of the groups they were most interested in, you guessed it, orchids. And they were actually founding members of the American Orchid Society. 
Um, Mrs. DuPont served as secretary and then as vice president of the society. But what was interesting was that through the Hagley project, we learned that despite, you know, Longwood being associated with Catlias and other tropical orchids from around the world, the first orchids that they ever bought were actually native orchids. And one of them is shown right there, Galliera spectabilis, which is blooming in the woods around here. And so I think this shows a little bit about their savvy and their interest in orchids. And so recognizing that not only do you have these big, beautiful tropical things that people often think of when they think of orchids, but you have these more diminutive, uh, but still showy native orchids um, that can be used in the landscape around here. And so we thought, well, this is really fascinating to us. And so we actually started a program to look at native orchids because here in Pennsylvania, believe it or not, we have 60 species of native orchids. Many of them are rare. And of about the 220 species of orchids in the United States, about half of them are, are, are rare or endangered or threatened in some way. And so what we did was we started this program dedicated to orchid conservation. And what we're really doing is we're working with orchids here in Pennsylvania and the Mid-Atlantic that allow us to develop expertise that can hopefully impact global orchid conservation. Because one great thing about orchids is that they're on every continent except Antarctica. And so there's sort of a, a currency within the plant world for people in the United States and beyond to communicate with others around the world because whether the orchids are in Pennsylvania or in Africa, that factors affecting them are largely the same. So it's a really great way to, to network across different um, parts of the world and, and learn more about what can be done to help work it. So this is exactly what we do. We start everything we do with partnership and collaboration development. We often, we, once those are in place, we do seed collection and we're really interested in seed banking, but also in seed propagation. Orchids are funny because they have these tiny dust-like seeds and they have very specific requirements for germination. You can't just sprinkle them on a pot and expect them to pop up like your tomatoes or your beans or something like that. They have to be germinated and work with under controlled conditions in a laboratory. And so it gives this, us this opportunity not only to work with these rare plants, but to do research. And so we do a lot of laboratory-based research on how we can grow orchids from seed. And the images you see there on the right are a couple of snapshots of what orchids look like as they're germinating and what the seedlings look like. And so we do a lot of work in our lab with the idea that we can help generate these orchids. We can publish papers about how other people can do this. And this funnels into collection. So if you were to come to the gardens now, you might be able to see Kentucky lady slipper and yellow lady slipper and other orchids that we've been able to propagate here out in the gardens. And so we're using this research to develop collections so that people um, can look at garden, orchids out in the garden and not just in the conservatory. And this research really helps funnel sustainable use of orchids. I'm gonna get into a little bit more about what that means and why that is, but it also allows us to help restore orchids in the landscape. And in a couple cases, we've actually propagated orchids here in Pennsylvania and started to plant them back into the wild with some of our partners. But all of this is rooted in exploration in Pennsylvania. And we do a lot of field work um, right here in Chester County and really throughout the state and the Mid-Atlantic looking for orchids because we really have this incredible diversity of orchids in Pennsylvania. And I mean, in the greater Mid-Atlantic, 70 plus species, some of them very showy, uh, like lady slipper orchids you see there on the left, others fog orchids like the orange platanthera, very, very showy plants, others, uh, more diminutive, not quite as showy, but still telling us very important um, information about the places where they occur. So a lot of work is being done with orchids here. I could do a whole presentation just on this particular work, but I'm going to move into some of the more exotic things we've done in the, uh, around the world, in particular here um, in Vietnam. And so Vietnam, if you, if you look at it, it's a country about the size of New Mexico. New Mexico being a desert state has about 14 or 15 species of orchids, believe it or not. Vietnam being in the tropics, high rainfall has about 1,500 species of orchids. And in some places, they're ultra concentrated, such as this karst landscape here in Northern Vietnam, right on the border with China. And down low where things can be cultivated and animals can be grazed, there's not a lot of diversity, but when you get up onto the tops 
of these limestone hills, there can be as many as 60 or 70 species of orchids up there. And it's largely because it's treacherous and going up there isn't easy. So it keeps out a lot of people who would be poaching orchids or looking for orchids or things like that, but it is still a problem. So we work a lot on lady slipper orchids native here in Pennsylvania. Vietnam happens to be a center of diversity for a different type of lady slipper orchid. And that's particular, particularly why we went there. And so if you climb up onto those limestone mesas, you can see the, the plant there on the right, Papiopetalum helena, that grows on vertical cliffs, north facing cliffs on those limestone hills. Beautiful plant, very, very rare in the wild. But because of the burgeoning uh, orchid trade in Vietnam and places in big cities like Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, but also places like Thailand, a lot of orchids are still taken from the wild and sold. And you can see the image on the left there shows all those Dixie cups filled with seedlings or divisions actually of uh, Papio Petal and Helena that were taken from the mountains. So the idea is that we have been working with partners there um, to develop laboratory protocols to learn how to propagate this so that that information could be disseminated with the hope that, you know, an orchid industry, much like we have here in the US, where we have artificially propagated plants that are not taken from the wild, can be offered to people and sort of quell or hopefully quell um, some of the demand for wild plants. So we've worked on this for a few years now, and we've been developing this expertise on orchids, but more recently, um, we went to Tanzania. And again, orchids were really quite at the center of this. And so if you look at Tanzania, uh, this is Longwood's first venture into um, this country in Africa. Again, all of this starts with partnership development. And so I went over in January um, to see if we couldn't start to work with some of the orchids in Tanzania. Um, and that's important because in the Southern Highlands where they occur, you have this incredible diversity of terrestrial orchids. So orchids that grow in the ground, um, not on tree limbs like uh, a lot of tropical orchids. And they make these big potato-like tubers. And the tubers are actually harvested and used to make a product called chikanda, which in neighboring Zambia used to be sort of a subsistence food, but now has morphed into a delicacy um, that's caused an enormous amount of pressure on orchids and people who are harvesting them or poaching them to make this particular dish. Unfortunately, Zambia has basically poached out all the highland areas um, where their orchids occur. And so now they're coming over the border into Tanzania and it's becoming a real issue. And so we, with our interest in orchids and conservation, this came onto our radar. And so the idea was for us to go over there, talk to the people who are, are you know, most close to this, this problem, um, see if we can't develop relationships, and then see if we can't scout for orchids and hopefully impact orchid conservation there in a very positive way. So that's exactly what we did. So just this past January, I went to Tanzania for nearly a month. Um, we visited a number of places in the southern highlands of the country. You can see um, some of the places I was in there. Arusha is up north. That's where you fly into. But Dodoma, Aringa, Mbeya, Mapinga, Wasa, these are all very small villages in the southern part of the country. And around them are these habitats, these grassland habitats that are really rich in orchids. So you can see a picture of our team there. I was fortunate to work with these really great people from the National Herbarium uh, in Tanzania and also from the San Severia, um, Tanzania San Severia Foundation. And just to tell you a little bit about what it's like, you can see some of the logistics there. So we had one Toyota Land Cruiser and think about sort of the iconic African safari vehicle. That's what we drove around in. Um, for a few weeks. We summited two of the highest mountains in the country, Mbeya Peak and Matwari Peak, and we had four people on our team. Myself, uh, Barry Yinger, who you can see there in the center, Robert Sakawa um, on the left, and Dr. Nedovoto Molel from the herbarium on the right. And along the way, uh, we met with many others, lots of park rangers, such as Senior Ranger uh, Mayunga that you can see there in the image. And they were really, it was this network of people that really helped facilitate this work. And I can't overemphasize the importance of those networks in doing this kind of work. We spent 24 days in the field and we traveled over
over 3,000 miles alone in Tanzania. And to give you an idea of the size of Tanzania, it's about twice the size of California. African countries are much bigger than they uh, look like they actually are on the map. And so, you know, through all of this, we traveled the back roads and we, we went into some really, really remote places in Tanzania. And in fact, sometimes um, it was so remote that the roads were just being developed and we would go way back into the country, such as we did here um, in the Kip and Gary range. And as we were coming back, the road was so new that they were actually, um, they had dug ditches in the road while we were out in the field. And then on the way back, um, we could no longer cross the road because they were putting in drainage. Um, um, as they would continue to build and improve this road. And so this is the first trip I should add, should have added to the, the list of logistical um, uh, facts there, the number of times we used a winch because we had to use it a lot to get in and out of these places because many of them are still extremely remote. And so if you think about Tanzania, it's a, it's a sub-Saharan African country and a lot of it is dominated by what they call Miombo forest. So it's a country where you have these very strong wet and dry seasons. And so for half the year, it rains a lot. And I was there in the rainy season and you can see on the image on the right, it rains a lot there at that time. And then about half the year, it doesn't really rain at all. And so you have this particular forest type called the Miyambo forest that's adapted to that. And it is char characterized by these sort of dwarf trees with a lot of uh, herbaceous plants, very, very rich, uh, floristically speaking. Tanzania is also dominated by termites. And in the image on the left, you see what looks like a tree and some shrubs, but those are actually growing out of a termite mound that's about six feet tall and about 15 or 20 feet wide. And these termites, create these mounds um, and create different habitats. And there's plants that only really grow on these termite mounds. And so you have this really fascinating um, uh, diversity of ecosystems um, within Tanzania that contribute to this really, really rich flora. So what we were really interested in was um, once you get out of the Miombo forest and you climb up into the mountains, you get up into these grasslands. And these grasslands are incredibly rich in flowers. And so one of the places that we were most interested in going um, was in the image you see here, the Cthulhu Plateau, um, which means the Garden of God in Swahili. And to give you a little bit of context about the Cthulhu, it's the first national park in Tanzania to be designated as such strictly because of the plants. And it is an absolute plant paradise, particularly um, when it comes to orchids. And I don't know that I've ever been to a place in my whole life where not only the diversity of orchids was so staggering, but just the sheer numbers of plants. In some places you could hardly walk through these grasslands without stepping on orchids. And just to give you an idea of, of what some of these look like, um, it's really interesting that the orchids in Africa are, are in many ways, from an evolutionary standpoint, very strongly or closely related to orchids that we have here in the US, because Africa used to be, in, in the geologic past, connected um, to the Americas. And so we share a lot of common plants. We don't have any satyriums here in the US, but this is very similar to other groups of plants that we have here in the US. And this group, satyrium, named because of the two spurs on the back of the flower is an absolutely incredible genus of, of plants, not only because they form these big tubers that are, are used for chikunda, but also because of their colors. Red, in particular, is a very rare color within the orchid family, and satyrium has many members of its genus which have red flowers, so they're really fascinating from that standpoint. Um, other groups of plants, Habanaria. Habanaria is spread all around the world. We happen to have some here in the US. And these are fascinating plants because they're mosquito pollinated. And so if you look at them, they're actually um, mimicking mosquitoes or flies or other things that pollinate them, but they're a very rich part of the orchid flora and Tanzania. And some of them are also used for Chikanda. One of the groups that we're most interested in seeing is the genus Disa. And Disa is an African genus of orchids, which, which is extremely diverse. I think there's 150 or 200 species of them. And they come in, it seems like every color of the rainbow, reds and purples and whites and, and oranges. And I wanted to particularly put these in there because 
Again, these are probably some of the most poached orchids for Chikanda, especially the one in the lower right there, Disa robusta. But what's a fascinating fact about a lot of, of orchids is that they're actually, when you see them, the flowers are upside down. They start right side up, but then as they open, they twist. And so the lip where the insect would land to pollinate is actually positioned upside down. Many African orchids don't have this feature. And so you can see in the images here, a lot of these orchids that you see are actually right side up orchids. And what's fascinating is that on the left, if you look at that big image, you can see the pollinator in there is actually upside down. So it's actually accounting for the fact that the flower is right side up. And so these orchids in Tanzania are fascinating, not only from a conservation standpoint, but also they seem to have the, these quirks and these peculiarities that you don't find in a lot of other orchids around the world. And so Disa is also of interest because we've been growing Disa's here at Longwood for quite a long time. Um, this is a different group, and these are some of the ones that we have here at Longwood, different ones because they're found mainly in South Africa. But again, this link to the collections at Longwood is always really important. So anything we work on, you know, potentially, you know, if we're doing conservation work, if we're doing research, there's a possibility that we'll have plants that come out of this that we can one day put on display or for perhaps use for breeding or any number of things. And so again, thinking not only about conservation needs, but linking back our plant exploration efforts um, to the history and the legacy and the collections needs, the plant collections needs of the garden. And so Thinking about orchid conservation in Tanzania, so one of the one of the reasons, the main reason we were there was to go around and find orchids and document them and make herbarium specimens. So you know, having an official documentation of of, of where they grew. And so um, since the time that I've been there, the team that I work with has gone back. They've collected seeds because one thing we want to know is if we have the seeds and we learn how to germinate them, you know, can people potentially use this information to propagate orchids? Orchids and, and farm them and, and use them for as a particular as a as a food source um, in some cases and so that's where we're at now and so we um, will be receiving seeds uh, from our partners there we'll do a whole series of research projects um, to learn how to do this and then hopefully one of these days we can start to share back that information and start to build the groundwork for um, these plants being propagated on a large scale throughout Tanzania to help um, with this conservation issue. There are other types of plants in Tanzania that we're interested in. And I mentioned the legacy, um, you know, tying back to collections and groups of plants that have been of interest to Longwood over the years. And Protea um, is another uh, group of plants that you can find in Tanzania that's been of great interest here. Typically, proteas are thought of as plants of South Africa and Australia. They're Mediterranean plants, and they're extraordinarily beautiful. And if they were adaptable here, you'd probably see them everywhere. But the thing is, they don't tend to like our heat and humidity in the summer. It's a little too cold in the winter. And so by and large, they just don't do well here. Now, there's a little tiny bit of this so-called South African Cape floristic region that sort of makes its way up into Southwest Tanzania and you get things like proteas growing in soils and in a climate that's quite different um, from where they typically grow. And so this provides a tremendous opportunity for us, you know, to bring back plants still, you know, we're still interested in bringing back plants and putting them on display, but bringing back, you know, seeds from this group of plants um, to trial here because they could be more adaptable than things that were trialed here in the 1960s and 70s. And again, this ties back to our legacy. I mentioned Dr. Russell Seibert. He was very interested in South African flora. He was very interested in proteas as Longwood's first director. You can see him there um, in our research greenhouses. But as our new West Conservatory comes in line, as the Longwood Reimagine Project um, comes to completion, plants like this collections like this in places like Tanzania could potentially impact the displays that you see in these new spaces um, in years um, in the future. Tanzania, uh, in addition to the many orchids that we we're focused on where we we're there, has, is extremely rich in all kinds of plants. African milkweeds, you know, milkweeds are a group of native plants here in the US that get a lot of attention. 
um, for pollinator issues. And there are many similar species that you find throughout Tanzania. And you can see some of them here. And some of them we think, um, especially the one on the right, we have not been able to identify. We're not sure if it's just a variant or something unique, but uh, you know, there's still a big potential for finding new species or at least finding things that have never been brought into cultivation. And so this is a group that really captured our interest. Um, in particular, this one, Glossostelma spabulatum. This is like a, a milkweed, a miniature milkweed with giant flowers. And so, you know, our hope is that one day we can bring back seeds of this, grow them on, and then maybe even display it one day at Longwood. Sansevieria, you know, Sansevieria is a group of plants. I often joke, you know, um, there's one, you can probably find one in every dentist's office in the United States, the classic Sansevieria trifasciata laurentii, a very, very common house plant. Well, it turns out that Tanzania is a center of diversity for the genus. And some of our partners have been working throughout the country to make new collections and bring new ones into cultivation and to find new species. And they probably found 20 new ones. And so I was able to visit um, where this work is happening and see them all together. And so just another indicator of the richest, richness and the diversity of the flora in Tanzania. And there were many other things, you know, rather than just um, going into, you know, a, a list of every favorite plant from Tanzania, I'll sum it up by saying, you know, I think that there's all kinds of, you know, interesting plants there. Many are beautiful, many of conservation interest. And this is a project uh, it seems like we're going to be working on for a number of years. And so um, as we were able to go back there and work more with our partners, hopefully we can bring some of this stuff here, put it on display and or tell more stories about the conservation work that we're doing there. And so all of this work that we're doing is rooted in the wonderful partnerships and people that we get to work with. And I already mentioned some of them, but uh, I do want to mention them again. We're working specifically with the Tanz Tanzania National Herbarium. And on the left is Dr. Nedavuto Molel. She is the director of that, of that institution. And she is really the gatekeeper for a lot of the work that we're doing. And it was a pleasure to get to know her. We uh, assisted her in collecting 385 herbarium specimens, so basically pressed dried plant specimens that go um, into their herbarium as a, as a permanent um, record of the occurrence of those particular plants. Um, Robert Sakawa in the center there, um, who is just instrumental in being able to get us into all these places by just networking with local people, uh, just one of those people that others tend to naturally gravitate towards and really opened a lot of doors for us. And then Barry Yinger, a native Pennsylvanian now living in Tanzania, was really at the, at the core of the nexus for this whole project and really helping getting everything off the ground. So a lot of what we're doing, as I mentioned, is really rooted in the partnerships and the people that we work with. So looking at this um, trip, we saw 74 kinds of orchids. We saw at least 60 other types of plants that we were really interested in. We were able to make some initial seed collections. We actually tagged 31 orchid sites with radio tags and GPS, and our partners went back and collected seeds just a few weeks ago. We collected 385 herbarium specimens, and we collected thousands of images. So a very, very successful trip. But ultimately, that all comes back to how does that funnel in here? And so if you were in the conservatory today, you might see a display like this. This looks more like a, a winter display. Um, but as you're walking around, you know, you can still see plants, um, depending on the time of the year and where you're at, that, that sort of are a, are a tribute to the legacy of plant exploration. And the Paracallus um, on the right there, and even the Echium on the left are a couple of those plants. Paracallus um, Longwood Blue or Longwood Blue Hybrid that you see on the right there is a plant that we put on display sometimes and it was the subject of a plant exploration trip because in the 90s it was used for display quite a bit at Longwood and what happened was it's kind of hard to grow and so people who were producing this plant producing the seeds stopped doing that but there was still interest in using it at Longwood and so what they did was is they went to the Canary Islands and collected relatives of it and you see the image there on the right of the two plants. You can see the hybrid, right? Looks kind of like a blue chrysanthemum at the bottom. And then the wild type, uh, which is a much different looking plant. And the researchers here actually hybridized those together to develop a stronger strain. And so, you know, there's a story, the story that you're talking about plant breeding and plant exploration um, behind some of these plants in the conservatory worth noting the next time 
um, you might be walking around. Caleria, Longwood Gardens, or Longwood, um, is one that came from Longwood Gardens first plant exploration trip in 1957. It's actually brought from a garden um, in Portugal, and it's one that we still grow in the gardens here today. Um, and one plant that you can see from Longwood's first plant exploration trip ever in 1957 is this Kalanchoe right here. So the next time you're in the Silver Garden um, in February, March, or April, you can look sort of behind the, the fence post cactus and other things and still see this growing there, which is really cool to me because, you know, plants come and go from the conservatories and, and horticulture is kind of like fashion. It can be a little trendy. So things come and go, uh, things are popular and then, you know, they kind of fall out of favor, but this plant has withstood the test of time. And so the hope is that, you know, the work we're doing now in, you know, here in the US and in Vietnam and in Tanzania can hopefully still be impacting the gardens um, decades or even centuries from now. So I'll wrap it up with Longwood Gardens' mission. And so Longwood Gardens is the living legacy of Pierre DuPont bringing joy and inspiration to everyone through the beauty of nature, nature conservation, and learning. And plant exploration is just one facet of all this. And so, um, you know, as you're walking around the gardens, you know, looking at the plants, um, hopefully this will inspire you to, to, to think uh, more deeply about the plants and to, and to look at them and to, and to really um, appreciate not only their beauty, but the stories behind them as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. We actually have a number of questions. First question, has there ever been a foreign non-native plant that has become invasive species in the surrounding areas of the gardens? Right, so that's one of the most common questions when we talk about plant exploration. And, you know, um, you know, we work around the world and certainly, you know, in places where there are species with invasive potential, but we work very hard to avoid those. And so we can't say that, you know, knowing what hindsight is 2020. And, you know, plants that might have come in, you know, decades ago, uh, some are showing invasive potential. And we do a lot of work to monitor these and to report this to others and to control them. And so, you know, when we're doing plant exploration now, we avoid groups of plants like honeysuckles and euonymus and, you know, other things that are known to have invasive members of their genus. So, you know, you can't ever know for sure, um, but we also, we work closely with um, USDA and the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service to make sure that we aren't bringing in any of those potentially invasive plants or potentially invasive insects or diseases as well. So a lot of work goes into the planning to avoid those particular kinds of um, issues. Thank you. We have a question from John. So in the past, orchid uh, evaluation by seed propagation was a daunting undertaking. Uh, hundreds of thousands of seeds created by a single pollination have to be cultured. Seedlings can take several years to reach bloom age and then an entire large greenhouse and a tr tremendous undertaking. So it sounds like uh, John has some experience in all of this between time and resources available. Um, are there new ways that have streamlined this process um, that have been established? Or is it really that long extended hard work and labor intensive Process. It is. It is still a long process. I mean, you think about, I think a lot of people think about an orchid as, you know, the phalaenopsis that you might see as, at the grocery store um, and things like that. And for certain sort of orchid crops like phalaenopsis, they have really streamlined the process through breeding, uh, through the laboratory work, through different things like that. And so those orchids might be ready to sell in a year or two. You know, some of the things we're talking about, especially our native orchids, it can take years. And part of what we work on is streamlining that process, you know, because for many native orchids, well, it isn't known how to germinate the seeds. And uh, for those that it is, it isn't known how to produce the seedlings and how to grow them on. And so, you know, people can often be shocked like, oh, this orchid costs $50 or $75 or $100. Well, that could be because it's already five or six or seven or 10 years old. And so, um, so you have to keep that in mind. And so that's you know, that's sort of at the core of what we're working on, you know, figuring out how to propagate a lot of them, how to whittle down the time and to how to how to get them out there and just make them more available. So that's sort of the, the essence of what we're doing. So people are working on it. There have been some strides. More work is needed. Linda had a question. How do you keep um, 
seed viable for more than one year? That's a good question. So seeds are really variable in their ability to be stored. You know, so you basically have two types of seeds. You have what are called orthodox seeds. So these are seeds that can be dried down and they can last for, you know, a matter of weeks to many decades if you store them the right way. Other seeds are recalcitrant, like a lot of our native tree species like oaks and black gums and things. The seeds cannot be dried down. And if you dry them down, you kill them. And so those seeds can't be banked. Like if you think of a seed bank, you can't really put them in there. So they have to be handled a different way. But for those seeds that can be dried down and stored like orchids, well, that's one of the things we're trying to figure out because we know in our work with native orchids that some of them will last for six months if we dry them and store them in the fridge. Others we know um, have lasted for eight years and, and we're still going and they're still viable. And I know certain seeds like lilies, um, you know, everybody knows the classic garden lilies. If you still, you know, take those seeds, you keep them dry, put them in your fridge, they could last 50 to 75 years or more. And so it's really, that's an active area of, of scientific research is how long do seeds last and what do they need to last? And, and it, it, there's a lot to that. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> Great. Leslie had a question. How do you bring plants and seeds are there special permits that are needed? Are they very difficult to get? Right. So, yes, that's a very good question. So you do need to have permits to bring seeds and plants back from overseas. And so um, the USDA APHIS, so USDA APHIS stands for Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. They issue permits. And so we work with them. I think the one we have for importing plants is called a PPQ 587. And that you know, allows you to bring in plants that are not restricted from entry. And one thing you need to know is there's a manual that they have called the Plants for Planting Manual. And it's a, a, a voluminous 900 page or so document that basically tells you what you can import, what you can import, if you can import plants or if you can only import seeds. And so it's up to the person who is able to get that permit to understand those regulations and restrictions before they bring them in. But, you know, this is something that anybody, you know, we do it as an institution here at Longwood obtain our permits, but even, you know, private individuals throughout the country are able to do this. And so there's a whole process about it online, but um, there's quite a bit of work in getting the permits, maintaining the permits, making sure that we're collecting things that are allowed uh, to come into this country. We also, there are inspection stations all around the country. We work with one in Linden, New Jersey. So we have a relationship with them. We try to let them know what we're bringing in. And so there's, there's quite a bit to that. And I could go on and on, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Wonderful. We have a question from Barbara. Is Longwood controlling the spread of colonia trees? So our Plonia LA is that, um, are those seeds tend to spread? They tend to spread and, you know, I, Polonia is a well-known invasive is south of here. We have not seen it um, seed around here. And I know that in the past they have been deadheaded to some degree, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's with climate change and other things, you know, Polonia tomentosa is one of those trees that didn't really bloom every year here. Now it's, things seem to be changing a little bit. And so um, we haven't done anything specifically, I don't believe, to control it. We certainly don't see it spreading around the gardens, but I think it's one of these species where, you know, historically um, it has a much different uh, perception than it does now. And it's one of those things that we'll keep an eye on. Sure. Another question, how long do you estimate what it take for a variety of protea to get to the Longwood shop? <laughs> Protea? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. Not, it's, it's certainly them arriving at the garden shop is not imminent. And, um, you know, it's one of those things we need to work on because Protea is in addition to, you know, if we found some that, um, you know, might be able to tolerate our climatic conditions, they are also, they are very sensitive to things like phosphorus in the soil. They don't tend to like to grow in containers and in these sorts of things. And so, even if we're able to get the seeds and, and, and germinate them and get them going, we still need to figure out how to grow them. And so, I, you know, I think it's one of those things that if they ever make it to the garden center, it's, it's gonna be a little while. Wonderful, we have a question from Kat, Kathleen. This is a little bit of a mystery of a question. So for a number of years, she saw a very large hanging basket in the conservatory. The identification tag indicated that the plant started in 1952. And during the last few of her visits, she was not able to find it. 
right? Any chance, are you familiar with this, this magnificent plant? Um, I, I, you might be thinking of the rabbit's foot fern, um, you know, which used to be in the fern passage and we still have it. It is now in the East Conservatory. So if you come in the East and go hard left, we have a little camellia garden there and it's hanging right there. I think that's the same one you're talking about, but believe you me, that is not, that is a plant that will be at Longwood as long as it's willing to, to live and grow here. That was the plant that came into mind as well. So we have a few more minutes. So please, if there's any additional questions, please add them into the chat, but I have a few as well. If you can go anywhere in the world to explore, where would you like to go? I, you know, that's, uh, that's a moving target. Um, one of the places I'd most like to go is uh, Papua New Guinea, um, which is, you know, one of the, it, I think it is the largest island in the world and, you know, sort of nestled there between Australia um, as part of Oceania and, I, you know, I'm professionally interested in orchids and personally interested in orchids and Papua New Guinea has a well known and very diverse orchid flora but there's still a lot of things um, being discovered there, especially terrestrial orchids. So I think if I had to pick one place today, um, that would be the place. Wonderful. Next question. Uh, John and Nancy are delighted by Eggsbury azaleas, hybrids of native, native deciduous species. Mm -hmm. Are there hybrids being bred of native orchids and trilliums? Um, there are be there are definitely some native orchid hybrids, and so particularly within the lady slipper orchids, you know, we have our natives that we have here. Uh, there's some people in Europe that have been hybridizing them with species that occur in China, and you can. I think some of those are starting to get out into garden centers. I'm not sure which ones exactly, but, but that is happening. And we've done that a little bit here. Our focus is really on maintaining the natives, but we have done a little bit of breeding too. But, but outside of that, um, with regard to our native orchids, there really hasn't been a lot of work done. And so I think part of it is because you know, a lot of these things just aren't in cultivation. And as we're doing, we're trying to figure out how to, how to get them into gardens and get them growing so that not only can we conserve them, but, you know, perhaps, you know, they could be hybridized or selected upon um, as you're suggesting, but really not, not a lot of that has been done. Um, what plant have you only heard about, but would like to see in its natural environment? One plant that um, is, has been blooming, um, and that probably might be on the minds of a lot of people is the crown imperial, Fritillaria imperialis, which is this, you know, kind of iconic, you know, spring flowering bulb. And we often think about it as a garden plant, but I would, I've seen pictures of it in the wild and it grows in places like, um, Iran and Eastern Turkey and, and places in these really dry mountains. And so it comes from these places where it doesn't look at all like it should be growing. And that is one plant I often think, man, I'd really love to see that in the wild and just try to understand more about, you know, why it's growing where it does and how that translates into how we grow it in our gardens. Wonderful. Barbara has a question about longwood water lilies and are they being grown for the seeds to be saved? So we, our water lily collection is mostly vegetatively propagated from the tubers or the rhizomes, but our Victoria water platters um, that you would often see out in the pools in the summertime, um, those are actually annuals, if you can believe it. And so um, Tim Jennings, who is our aquatics grower, every year he painstakingly makes crosses between them when they're growing out in the ponds. Um, um, harvest the seed um, and then grows the seed every winter. And so those plants, you know, the water platters, I know that part of the garden's not open right now. I think it will be next year, um, but or when it, whenever it opens again, the next time you're out there in August or September and you see these Victorias that are 25 feet across, keep in mind that those are only about eight months old from seed. And so they grow incredibly quickly. Like it's one of those plants where you can watch a movie, you know, look at the plant, watch a movie and come back and it's like, oh, you can already tell that it's grown. Um, so those are grown from seed every year. And we actually send the seeds of those plants because we get many more than we need um, to gardens all over the world because they're difficult to grow and not everybody has the capability or the capacity to be able to generate the seeds. And so I think last year we sent seeds of those to at least 60 other gardens worldwide. 
That's fantastic. And our water lily court will reopen in summer of um, 2025. So after the uh, West Conservatory opens, and then that next summer is when the water lilies will be back. We have another question about, will Longwood expand, uh, expand its CICAD collection? Um, they are so rare and Longwood has some, uh, has some really that are one of a kind. And so they were wondering if there will be more. Um, hopefully, and you, if you've been to the gardens lately, you've noticed that, you know, many old cycads used to reside in the palm house, uh, which isn't there anymore, but they were moved, you know, recognizing that they're rare, but also very large specimens, you know, basically priceless specimens, um, you know, a lot of them were moved into the East Conservatory, and so you can see those there. Um, we do have back in our research greenhouses a collection of cycads that we're growing on, which hopefully can be displayed one day. But um, as, you're, as you suggest, you know, they grow very slowly. They're kind of like orchids. You know, it takes a long time um, for them to get up to size and really, you know, get to the point where they can be on display. So, the, you know, the, the answer is yes, hopefully, but it's going to be one of those things that happens very gradually over time. Thank you. Um, another question that we received, um, through all of your, your travels, I'm sure there has been times that, that you're of course not familiar, you are with people of that area, but have you ever worried about your personal safety? I, well, knock on wood, no, personally I haven't. I would say that the, um, <laughs> The least safe I ever felt was actually some field work I did in grad school before I came here in Arkansas, of all places. But um, but generally, you know, uh, you, no, I, I feel very fortunate. I mean, we've been in some, you know, some situations that were a little bit tense. And like I mentioned with, um, you know, in Tanzania, we went way out this road and we came back and they had dug these ditches and we had no way to get around. So, you know, that was more annoying than, you know, you know, being a problem, but um, you know, fortunately, no, I've not not had any situations, um, you know, any emergency situations or anything. Well, we will uh, end with one last question: um, Are there any countries that no longer have plant explorations? Well. Um, Plant exploration is in a sort of a new era now because of a treaty called the Convention on Biological Diversity. And so this is a treaty that has been um, ratified by every country in the world except for the United States and a couple others, maybe Sudan um, and, and a couple others. But basically what it says is that the, the plants that occur in a given you know, country are basically their property. And so it's up to them to decide, you know, um, how they want to release it or let, you know, if they want to let people come and do exploration. And so some countries are still very open to it. And so Tanzania happens to be one of those countries. Um, other countries are much more difficult. Thinking about places like um, Peru um, and Colombia and Brazil. Um, and that's because in those countries, you have the progenitors of things like tomato and potato and, you know, and these really important agricultural crops. And so there could be, you know, potential value in wild types bringing disease resistance to crops and things like that. And so these countries um, have a much more hardline stance on, on being able to do that. I don't know if there are any countries per se that have said, no, we're not going to allow plant exploration, but some countries are much easier to navigate with that regard than others. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Peter. Thank you for sharing all of this information with our members. We can hear your passion and your love for your work. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a recorded presentation will be emailed to all attendees. And I would also like to uh, thank you, our members. Your support not only preserves our rich legacy, but also helps Longwood Gardens to continue to inspire many generations to come. So thank you from all of us from Longwood. Have a great day.